Hello again and welcome to another edition of Suds and Country. Hi, I'm Herb Suds and welcome to the show. I have a very special guest. I mean, uh, a very special guest. Man's name is Earl Scruggs. He's the legendary Earl Scruggs from, well, how long have you been playing music, Earl? As Grandpa Jones said one time, ever since it started, I reckon. <laughs> Grandpa Jones knows what to say, don't he? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're pretty much the architect of bluegrass music. I read a clip in the newspaper. Is that pretty much true? I don't know what you call bluegrass, really. I, uh, as far as uh, my style of picking, I started in 1945, and I, I was up close to 1960 before the word bluegrass uh, was uh, ever labeled on music. But anyway, uh, I started in 1945 and been in it ever since. Okay. Uh, the Flat and Scruggs, we're going to talk about the Flat and Scruggs days. Yeah. Flat and Scruggs played an intricate, energy-fused bluegrass sound. How did that differ from any other music played at the time? Uh, well, it, it was the fiddle, uh, banjo, guitar, mandolin, and uh, bass. I guess I'm naming all of them to start with. And then later we added uh, Josh Graves, who played the dobro guitar. But that was in 1955, I believe, when Josh came to work with us. Were you the first person to use the banjo as a primary instrument in bluegrass music, or did you use the banjo in a different way in the music you played? Hmm. Well, I was the first one to take uh, this kind of banjo picking to Nashville. I was about 10 years old, and I, I used to pick finger and thumb, two-finger style, it was called, and that was the old style of playing, and I was about 10 years old. I was playing a tune that I still play today, which is Reuben, and uh, this role came to me one day when I was picking that tune by myself at, at home, and uh, I, it sounded so good that I, I just stayed with it, and then, uh, of course, I've learned different things with the three-finger since then, but uh, the the songs that you do will alternate your will alter your uh, role a little bit to in other words you keep your keep your tune going out front where people can tell what you play and the other fingers are just something to meter out all right when you uh when you joined when you f formed the uh foggy mountain boys mercury records picked you up shortly after you joined after you made the put the group together yeah um how did Mercury Records find you so quick, back in 48? Well, there wasn't that many bands out, and Mary Nash was the A&R man for Mercury Records, and uh, he wanted us to go to work on, on uh, Mercury, and re we recorded for a little while with Mercury, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, we did 12 sides and, and left and went with Columbia Records. Yes, but did. we started, Lester and I started with uh, Mercury Records. How did you get the name Foggy Mountain Boys? Where'd that come from? I don't have to take the guilt for that, I guess. <laughs> uh, when, when you first start out, really, all names just sound so, so you don't know what to name a ba band. So I, I thought we could go with Foggy Mountain Boys and have Foggy Mountain Top for a theme song mm -hmm. was my first idea. But uh, the Foggy Mountain Boys stuck, but the theme song we later dropped it and st used other tunes. Okay. <laughs> you played guitar in some of the early recordings on the Mercury, such as Jimmy Brown and Newsboy, and you played it three-finger style. We just stuck with three-finger style. Why is that? Was that three-finger style out before you discovered it or before you played it? Or did you, because you got credit for it, called the, flow, the Scrug style of music? Uh, there was some picking style. I don't know if they used, like Doc Watson. Doc, Doc came a little bit later, yeah. but Doc only uses the thumb and index finger, I think. I'm correct saying that. He still gets a three-finger roll sound out of the thing. But I, I guess I, well, I started with the banjo and, and played a little guitar just around the house for my own amusement. But it just worked out better to go ahead and do a kind of a banjo roll on the guitar. You did some, okay, all right. You kind of, uh, from what I read, you kind of reborn again that banjo into the world of bluegrass using thumb index and middle fingers. Did this, all right, I asked that question. Your first banjo you purchased was from Montgomery Ward for 1095. What was the year was that? Oh, I don't remember. It was oh. late 30s or about 1940. 
You had a Gibson RB11 trade to Don Reno, didn't you, for his Granada? The first uh, uh, good banjo I ever bought was a RB11, and I, I played that thing for several years, and we did a show at Blyville, Arkansas, one Sunday afternoon, I believe it was on a Sunday, uh, down in a field below a barn, and it started raining. And before I could get to the barn out of the rain, it had saturated that banjo, and that pearl inlay on that banjo just turned loose, the glue did. So I was forced to buy another banjo, so I bought my first uh, Master Tone banjo after that. Now, is your banjo that you play any different than any other banjo you can buy off the uh, shelf today? Not a, not a bit. It's uh, it's just an early Granada. Mm -hmm. Mine's originally a Granada banjo and used to be gold plated, which don't put you here or there. But uh, and and some of it had to be replaced. And at the time, I was too busy to stop and let somebody plate the, the banjo, so I I would just replace it with the uh, chrome. That's but the old tone ring on it it's never been touched and it still looks like a. A penny that's been lost for 50 years, it's so tarnished, but uh, uh, that's, that's my story. With A friend of mine once said that Earl Scruggs' banjo was one of a kind, and it, it plays, it, it, it sounds so different than any other banjo, and it's just a regular banjo. Oh, it's just, just a regular banjo. Most of the banjo do have just a little bit of different tone. I okay. don't think you, they can manufacture them where they'll all sound exactly alike. But no, mine has not been modified in any way at all. It's just a regular Granada Gibson banjo. How many years you played this banjo? I started with it, Louise, what was about 47 or 9? 49. 1949, she says. Uh, I've been playing that banjo. Let's go back a couple of years now. You joined the Bluegrass Boys in December of 45, and we're referring to, of course, Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys. How'd you get that audition to, for that? I was in Nashville with a, a guy, his name was John Miller. He went by, lost John Miller and his allied Kentuckians. Right. Right about that. And uh, in the group with Bill was Jim Shoemate, a fiddle mm -hmm. player from Hickory, North Carolina. And uh, we'd go into Nashville every weekend and, and do the show, and I'd have breakfast at Tulane Hotel with Jim Shoemate every Saturday. And Jim was wanting me to quit and go to work with Monroe. Well, John was treating me fine and I hated to leave. And But uh, finally John decided to get off in the road and I mm -hmm. told Shoemate, well, if he wants to hire me, he can come and listen to me. And that's how I got the, the job with Bill. Did you change Bill sound at all when you joined? Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> uh, he had a tenor banjo playing player with him at the time, and before that was Strang Bean. Right. So uh, at, at any rate, uh, I went into the group, and then he went to a five-piece group. Uh, he used to have a accordion in, in the band. Mm -hmm. Sally Forrester's wife of Big Howdy mm -hmm. Forrester, and uh, she stayed. Uh, Forrester had gone into service, and she, uh, she made it joined the the group and then uh, I went to work with Monroe and uh, Forster got out of service and came back and she made to, went back to Hickory. I just want to make mention I read where Bill paid you guys 60 bucks a week. Sixty dollars uh, a week uh, which would be ten dollars a day and then if we worked on Sunday we made seventy dollars. We paid our own hotel bills <laughs> laundry bills and everything. How was it commuting? How was it traveling around those days? Because everybody had to get back to the Opry for Saturday night, didn't they? Let me tell you how it works then. And, and it was two lane highways <laughs> everywhere. Right. Monroe had a 41 Chevrolet car that probably had 300,000 miles on it. The speedometer was broke and had been broke, broken for several years. See, they didn't make any cars from uh, 1941, was the last car until after the war. And uh, he had bought that 41 Chevrolet at some point after 41, and uh, it was still going when I went to work with him, and, and he kept it until just before I left. He, he sold it and bought a Packard car. So that was my traveling in, with Bill Monroe was in the 41 Chevrolet car. Okay. Were you considered a sideman in the band in those days? Well, that's what it would amount to, but the word side man had never been used. I just felt like I was a bluegrass boy. Bluegrass boy, okay. 
Uh, you left the Bluegrass Boys in 48, and uh, soon, shortly thereafter, you and Lester uh, got together and formed the Foggy Mountain Boys, the two of you. Um, do you remember the first members of the Foggy Mountain Boys? I sure do, but first, uh, Lester was in, in Monroe's group. Yes, he was. So, so I was with Lester from almost from the time I went to work with Bill until we, uh, we then when I left, Lester left, and we formed the Foggy Mountain Boys. So. Uh, my and Lester's association goes back to, back to 1945, and uh, then when we left, we formed the group and had Jim Shoemate on fiddle, Mike Wiseman was mm -hmm. with us, mm -hmm. uh, Cedric Rainwater on bass, and uh, Lester and me. It's a five-piece group. Fiddle. When did Chubby Weiss come in? Chubby came in a few years, uh, oh. two or three years. Oh, I'm sorry. Later, yeah. Shoemate was the first mm -hmm. one, and he he stayed. Uh, Around a year, a little longer than, uh, well, Chubby, uh, Chubby never did work with us very long, not with Lester and me. Of course, Ch Chubby was with uh, Monroe all the time. I was with Monroe. How many players have there been going through the, how many players became Foggy Mountain Boys between the beginning of the group to the 1969 when it disbanded? Do you have an idea? I, well, I can't uh, accurately answer no. that question, but we didn't have much change over. Okay. Uh, most most people we started with uh, stayed with us all through. I've been doing all the research here that I realized that you had the best of the who's who and of uh, players in your bands, and you guys know how to pick good musicians. I'll tell you. Well, we certainly did, and and then we played with each uh, each one stayed in the group so well so long till we really knew how to work with each other. We had a good band, I thought. You, you played a lot of radio stations in the old days, WXNOX, WSM, WDVA, WHK, WCYB, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they were all local stations. How did those local stations operate in those days to get groups like yours to play on them? Well, in, in Knoxville, WNOX, they had a show there which had been running for several years called the Midday Merry-Go-Round. And then in Bristol, they had started a show called Farm and Fun Time on WCYB. So we went over there in 1948, Lester and I did, and uh, it was the Farm and Fun Time show, and, and that's where we got our start. Okay. Um, today's radio stations, they don't do that anymore. They don't have bands playing up there. No, I think that's the thing in, in the past. But, I, I, you know, I, I enjoyed that. They had a, a lot of good bands uh, working full-time, and on Saturday you could just turn the dial and find groups of pe people on good radio stations. Yeah. How far north and west did those stations go? I, I can't truthfully. Can't tell. Okay. As you said earlier, as we mentioned earlier, you were on Mercury, and then you went over to Columbia. In 1952, you were you had a Billboard Top Ten song with "Too Sweet to Be Remembered." Mm-hmm. That's a tune that first heard Mike Wiseman. He used to sing yeah. that song. Yeah. How did it feel to have a top ten? Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, we uh. We were fortunate enough to uh, stay with uh, is all radio in the early oh, days, sure. and then went went to Nashville, uh, sponsored by Martha White Mills, and uh, they they were a real good sponsor, and he he believed in country music, and that's what he built his uh, his, his milling company on, practically as far as advertising is concerned. Now. I'm going to ask you a question. You've been around, and I've heard this question, but when did, well, was, was always country music or bluegrass. Why don't you hear the stringed instruments on country stations, and at country stations you don't play bluegrass, and bluegrass don't play country? It's, when did the split actually take place, or did it, did it, is it in my mind that there was never a split? I can't truthfully understand that. I, I remember one time years ago when the, uh, uh, and a lot of radio stations, they even banned bluegrass yeah. music, but... Uh, Why? I don't know. Well, one, one Good thing, music. It's good music, but uh, the, there were some that getting to record it in such a volume, sometimes it wasn't too, okay. too, too good a yeah, group. Right. So I think they just, rather than try to pick records and, and throw out records, they just, mm. some of them banned. Uh -huh. mm. but, but the music you played was considered more country, because you were on a lot of old country stations. We never build our music as bluegrass. We we just country. Okay. Good old country music. When did the syndicated shows come into into the lineup here? 
I don't know. And Louise, can you remember when syndication okay. came in? 1957, she said. And that helped you out a lot because you were able to get around more. You sent tape shows in Nashville and sent them around. It sure did. We, I forget how many radio stations we were on. We'd, we'd, we'd cut uh, uh, four shows at the time, and, and that turned us loose. See, we used to do early morning program and go out and come back at 2 o'clock and get up at 4 and do a radio program. That was that, that was hard to do. Hard on his life. Yeah. yeah. You joined the old Dominion Barn dance, didn't you, back in the old, and how, whenever? About 1954, I believe it was, we went over there and stayed uh, six months, or maybe not quite that long, and uh, went back to Nashville and, and started working full-time with Martha White. And you did the uh, Broadway show, hey, Ryan? Yeah, we sure did. Went up to New York, stayed two weeks, and uh, uh, went back and stayed a little while, and that's when we got a call from Martha White to, to come to work full-time at WSM Grand Ole Opry. Latin Scruggs was among the entertainers who recorded transcripts for the U.S. Armed Forces. Syndicated radio show Country Styles USA? Sure did. I'd forgotten that title. Yeah, we did uh, several Army and Marine shows. One, uh, 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 the announcer was Apple B or something, Apple something. You, uh, you joined the Opry in 1955. I believe that's, that's with uh, Lester Flatt. Right. And... Uh, Lester and I uh, worked together until 1959. Okay. How many, just just if you can recollect, how many times did you play the Opry? A bunch? You? Well, we used to be, when I first went there, you had to be there every, every okay. Saturday night. They didn't have any extra groups. Everybody that was on was a member of the Grand Ole Opry. Now, they, I don't know how many groups uh, uh, they'd turn over each Saturday night. Um, was there, was there any controversy about you joining the Opry? Was there any, nothing? No, okay, because no. I read something about that. Um, what songs, what songs did you play that were crossovers on the pop charts? Whatever went oh, over. I don't know. Don't know that one. I know the Beverly Hillbillies. Ballad of Jack Clamp in 62. Yeah, that was a big crossover. And that, you got denominated for a Grammy in that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm uh, also uh, going to be put into the walkway of stars this go. coming year. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm proud of that. Uh, you have every reason to be proud of that. You put enough you played enough music and you you deserve that. Now it was the first number one the first number one song ever on the country charts of the Ballad Jet Clampett. I believe that's right. Mm hmm Well let me ask you a question. Why did Jerry Scoggins sing that song? Why did he? Yeah, what's wrong with you guys? Well uh, the only thing I know Paul Henning told us that when he did that show, he didn't know if the theme would have to be changed because of a sponsor that was on the show. And he said that Jerry Scoggins, living there in California, if he needed a, a word or something changed in the theme song, he could right. change it then. Right. You made some appearances on the Beverly Hillbillies. We did. Uh, we was a guest every year for six or eight years, something like that. I just saw you the other morning. I was just telling you, singing Mail Order Bride, because Jed Clamper was looking for, for a bride there. Oh, yeah. And you and uh, Lester singing Mail Order Bride. Um, How did you guys get to Carnegie Hall back in 1962? So there she sits over there. <laughs> <laughs> There's the lady responsible for it, huh? Yeah, my wife uh, okay. put us in there. She's been my agent since 1955, really, and uh, she's the one that booked us in Carnegie Hall. and. Okay. All of the work that I ever did from 1955 on, she was my agent. How did how did feel to play the world stage? They call it, isn't it? Oh, at Carnegie Hall, that was I enjoyed that. There's good acoustics and, I, and the crowd was just really good, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You have an album that says Flat and Scruggs at Carnegie Hall. We Where went. Get, get my album. We we went into Carnegie Hall and. Uh, I forget what was said, and but Don Law was our A and R man for Columbia Records at the time, and something was said about recording, and Louise said, "All you need is set up an eight-track recorder and and catch it, and you you've got you an album, and this is a uh, this is what turned out from there it. There it is. Yeah, there that it was is. it. Mm -hmm. right. I brought a couple of toys along to play with here. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. let's talk about the Earl Scruggs family album, uh, family and friends album, mm -hmm. recorded back. I think it was just last year, wasn't it? You had the who's who of all kinds of music, man, from Elton John to Sting to Steve Martin, Melissa Etheridge, Leon Russell, Billy Bob Thornton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 
How did it feel to do that one? Oh, that was great. And I'll have to give Randy, my son, credit for that. He produced that album, and he uh, invited these people to come aboard and was fortunate enough that they were in town long enough uh, to do that. For instance, uh, well, they wasn't in Nashville. We went to Atlanta and got uh, Elton John and went out in Texas and got uh, uh, one, one or two artists. But we traveled from all the way to California before that album was completed. How many days on the, are you on the road a year now, today? Oh, not near like I used to be. I, I just do special dates like here. Uh, How many when your peak day? Oh, <laughs> it's just... Are it, you home? <laughs> it didn't seem like it, but yeah, we used to do an awful, uh, too, mu too, too, much. too much work. But uh, anyway, the demand was there, and we were young and right. able to take it. The awards, I ran out of paper writing down all the awards you got. Yeah, we've been fortunate enough to have a lot. A lot We're thankful for that, yeah. CMAs and IBMs and IB, IBM and CMAs and I, all the letters you have. And how many Grammys did you guys get? You got a lot of... Oh, I, I don't really, really remember. And uh, Columbia, you were 45 years with Columbia already? Yeah, for yeah, 45 years. It don't take long to use up. <laughs> 45 years, does it? No, it didn't <laughs> seem like it. All right, tell you what, what do you, just one before we close the show, what do you think of the old brother soundtrack? Did it help out any? I, I imagine it has. It's hard to put a measuring stick on things like that, but I tell you, I, I welcome anything that comes in that, uh, that tries to stay country to, uh, okay. to help country right. music. I'm for country music, and I'm glad to see it come in. Your instruction books are pretty popular. Yeah, that's been a, a great asset to artists who want to learn to play the banjo. And they're still available today? Yes, sir. Sure are. Um, that's about it. I just want to... Oh, what do you... what? Being a... Been on the road for so, so many years, what do you, advice do you have for the newcomers coming on the road today? Well, the only thing I can advise people to do is uh, what I experienced and learned myself is uh, be determined and try to be as professional as you can. And uh, I think if, if you've got some good talent under your belt and, and try to, uh, it's your management. It's like uh, any company, it's no good unless you've got good, ma good management. So uh, with good management, uh, I think uh, musicians ha have, would have a great future. I think everybody should have a Louise with them too, huh? Not her, but one like her. One like her, that's what I mean, <laughs> of course, but she's definitely helped. Oh, yeah, I wasn't for Louise. I'd have starved out yeah. 40 years ago. <laughs> well, thank you, sir, for being on my show. I appreciate it, Earl. It's been my pleasure. Thank